the ratio, the fraction of the weight of an object on Mars to the weight of the object on the Earth is 0 0.4 to 1. Now how that's written is this. The first thing that said, the weight of an object on Mars, okay, weight on Mars, weight on Mars. The word two is a fraction bar actually, and um, the weight of an object on Earth. So weight on Earth. is 0 0.4 to 1. And so the question is, how much will a 137 pound astronaut weigh on Mars? Well, that weight is on the Earth. And so we're going to solve this. We're going to solve it by cross multiplying because when you have one fraction equals one fraction, you have a proportion and you can cross multiply by imagining that there's an invisible X going through the equation and you just multiply along the diagonals. So X times one is X. X. And 0 0.4 times 137. So all I have to do is, let's see, round to the nearest tenth. I have to know how, exactly how much to round to. So, 0 0.4 times 137. Well, it's already rounded. It doesn't need to be rounded. So, 54.8. Fifty four point eight. I guess they'd use pounds. Can I go to Mars? I could lose weight. Without having to do anything. Now that's the important thing. Without having to do anything. Questions about this. You did proportions long ago. So I was concerned you might not remember them. Look at that smiling, happy face. Just look at that. I, I don't guess the, the fish, the trout is very happy, but the girl is happy. Okay, to determine the number of trout in a lake, a conservationist catches 198 trout, tags them, and throws them back in, traumatizing them so they have to go to fish psychiatrists for the rest of their lives. Later, 40, 42 trout are caught, and 14 of them are tagged. 14 of them are already tagged. How many trout would you guess, or would the conservationist guess, um, is in the lake, are in the lake? So to me, it seems like you have to kind of stop and think about this. Okay, you've got the conservationist at the lake, and he catches 198 trout. That's out of all the trout. So what we're talking about is tagged, I mean, this is how I chose to write it. Tagged trout 
over all trout. And I guess I could say trout. So in the beginning, the conservationist tags 198 trout out of all the trout in the lake. And we don't know how many that is. Later, he comes back and 14 of them are tagged. Out of a sample of 42 trout. So here you have 198 out of all the trout equals 14 out of a grand total of 42 trout that are caught. And then he looks and sees um, which of them are tagged. I mean, how many are tagged? All right, so again, all I'm going to do is cross multiply. 14 times X equals 198 times 42. And really, I don't even need to bother to multiply those yet. I'm going to go ahead and divide by 14 so I can do it all in one step. So that's going to be 198 times 42 divided by 14. 594. Now, frankly, I would want to round it to 600, wouldn't you? But 594 is going to be our answer. Notice they imply, wait a minute, let me write trout in lake. The only problem with this is that you're not told how many trout are in the lake. Of course, that's what you end up having to find. But you have to kind of work that out in your head, unless it's just obvious. So are there any questions about this? No. Okay. Now. Let's clear this to get ready for the next deal. What we've got here is airplanes. Like you couldn't guess. But this is going to be a rate times distance problem. And nobody really likes rate times distance problems. So the first thing we need to do is talk about when you move through a fluid. In this case, air is a fluid. Water is a fluid. So when you're moving through the water or moving through the air, how fast you end up going, your rate of speed your overall, I should say overall overall rate of speed is made up of two components. You've got the motor or if you're in the water, you know, rowing could kind of be the motor. You've got the uh, the power of the motor, but that would be the, the speed that the motor is supposed to be going at. The speed of the motor plus 
plus the speed of the water or wind, the speed of the fluid. Now in math books, I hate it that they call it this, they call that instill air. I like it that it's called cruising speed. The cruising speed in still air is 580 miles per hour. OK, that's kind of nice. So we'll call this the cruising speed. Uh, let's say in still air. Most of the time in most math books, they use the words in still air. But of course, there is no such thing as still air. Sometimes the air can feel still, but it can feel still but it's still moving a little bit. And, and the, the plane wouldn't stay up in the air if the air were really still. So I'm glad the authors of this book came up with cruising speed. How cool is that? I'm gonna use that from now on. And in this case, this is gonna be the speed of the wind. And the overall formula we're going to be using is D equals RT, where this is the time of travel rate is rate of speed, so we'll say speed. And D is distance. All right, now we're going to go back and read this more carefully, but I wanted to kind of prep you. A plane flies 2,468 miles with the wind, meaning with the wind at its back, giving it a push. In the same amount of time, it can fly 2,172 miles against the wind, with the wind causing the, the plane to slow down. Now, the cruising speed in still air is 580 miles per hour. Find the speed of the wind. Okay. That means the speed of the motor or the in still air plus the speed of the wind. So first, we could do this. We could say speed through the fluid plus the wind speed if they're going in the same direction. But we know what it is, right? Oh, the fluid is the wind speed. I mean of the motor. So let's go back. And here, since they're calling it cruising speed, that would be, if for this first case, if the plane is traveling with the wind, giving it an extra push, that would be the cruising speed plus the speed of the wind. So if that's, if it's traveling with, with the wind, if it's traveling against the wind, then you'd have the cruising speed minus the wind speed. So that's what your rate would be. Now the distance, which equals rate times time, and you know what the distance is,
this, these would be the formulas you were working with. Luckily, they give us some information. So we could even make a kind of a little chart. Or not. To, to uh, figure out with the wind. We're told that a plane flies this far with the wind. So the distance the distance is going to be twenty four sixty eight. The cruising speed is 580. That's what it says right there. So we're going to have the cruising speed plus the speed of the wind times the time traveled. We don't know what it is, but we are told it's the same as against the wind, the time. I'm going to move that T closer. The time of travel against the wind you're going to have uh, 2172 equals 580. See, they get, uh, you're going to get slowed down by the wind times T written exactly the same way, or almost exactly. Oh, that's D, never mind. Yes, T is written as close as I can get to exactly the same as that, because it says here in the same time, in the same amount of time. So the times are equal. So here are our two equations. 2468 equals 580 plus W times T, and 2172 equals 580 minus W times the same amount of time. So what do you do with this? Well, there's a quickie way to make it a little bit less problematic. And that is, if you know that the times are equal, time equals time, then all we have to do is solve each of these equations for time and set them equal to each other. That's a wonderful idea. So I'm going to solve for T and divide both sides of this equation by 580 plus W. 580 plus W. Boom, boom. So T equals 24, 
68 over 580 plus W. And this T will divide both sides by 580 minus W. 580 minus W. That's what T is going to equal. So that'll go right here. 2172 over 580 minus W. And they're going to be equal to each other because this is the time travel with the wind. This is the time traveled against the wind, but they're exactly equal. Now that could look really difficult. Were it not for the fact that this is another proportion. This is one fraction equals one fraction, which takes something that could be difficult and makes it easier. Because I can cross multiply. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say 2172 times 580 plus W equals 2468 times 580 minus W. And given that there are big numbers, I mean, everything is harder when numbers are big, but still, still, all we're going to have to do is distribute and distribute and then solve. So, let's do it. Twenty one seventy two times five eighty Oh, I hate big numbers. One million two hundred fifty nine thousand seven hundred sixty. plus 2172 times W equals 2468 times 580 1,431,440 minus 2468 W. Piece of cake, right? Well, it's, it's ugly, but it's doable. I'm going to add this W term over here, plus 2468 W plus 2468W. So we're going to have one, four, 
three. Let me make sure I got this right. One, four, three, one, four, four, zero over here. And over here, we're going to have one, two, five, nine, seven, six, zero plus. Mm. All right, let's do this by hand. Two plus eight is 10, carry the one. One plus seven is eight. Plus six is 14. Carry the one. One plus one is two, plus four is six. And two plus two is four. Let me double check. Two plus eight is 10, carry the one. Yes. Seven plus six is 13, plus one is 14. One plus four is five, plus one is six. Two plus two is four. Okay, piece of cake, children, right? Yes. Now I'm going to subtract this from that. So, one, four, three, one, four, four, zero, minus one, two, five, nine. Seven six zero Enter is one seven one six eight zero. Now I divide both sides by forty six forty. Boom, boom. The speed, uh, speed of the wind is four, six, four, zero. Thirty seven miles per hour. All that suffering. Still, I'm glad I don't have to round it. Piece of cake, right? <laughs> 